Hello everyone and welcome to chapter 25, Circulatory and Lymphatic System Infections. The circulatory lymphatic systems of the body are two separate systems, but that are so closely linked together that infections of one often amount to infections of the other. So we discuss them together. This is probably the heftiest chapter in terms of the number and volume of infections that we're going to cover. But as usual, before we dive into those, we are going to take a brief look at the structure of the circulatory and lymphatic systems. So the circulatory system is responsible for circulating your blood, which is composed of the red blood cells, white blood cells, platelets, and plasma together throughout the body. And it's driven by the pumping action of the heart. It plays important roles of delivering oxygen to the tissues of your body, as well as removing waste carbon dioxide from those tissues. The path that blood takes as it travels from the heart is that it flows away from the heart in arteries, and then those arteries narrow into smaller arterioles which narrow further into these fine little capillaries. And this is where the gas exchange takes place, where oxygen is pushed out and carbon dioxide is brought in. So after it moves through the capillaries, the blood is officially deoxygenated. And now it's moving back towards the heart and it does so through venules, which are then gathered together into larger diameter vessels called veins and then it reaches back to the heart and the process starts over again. Now, how is the circulatory system related to the lymphatic system? So the lymphatic system is actually connected to the circulatory system. The lymphatic system carries a fluid called lymph in it, which is rich in a variety of different leukocytes and the plasma in blood capillaries will pass through the interstitial spaces between cells and it will move into the lymph capillaries and it turns into the lymphatic fluid. So there's this constant exchange of material between the circulatory and lymphatic systems. And this means that pathogens and leukocytes are exchanged between them. So pathogens that are picked up in the blood can be transported to the lymphatic system. And in that way, the organism that infects the blood is now also infecting the lymphatic system as well. Lymph capillaries travel in a very similar way that the blood does. It is not driven by the pumping action of the heart. It is driven by gravity. So it's not a pressurized system, but in the same sense that in the circulatory system, there are larger vessels that sort of break off into smaller branches and yet even smaller capillaries. The lymph system is set up the same way. So there are lymph capillaries and then the larger of these tubes is the lymph vessels and the lymph vessels leads to lymph nodes. Lymph nodes are these small bean shaped chambers occurring throughout the lymphatic system. Here is a schematic of how the lymphatic system produces lymph that travels throughout the body. And in these lymph nodes, there is a high concentration of phagocytes, B cells and T cells which we already know are responsible for destroying pathogens. So as we move through our discussion of diseases, there's some general disease terminology that is good to know. The first term is bacteremia. Bacteremia is defined as an illness associated with bacteria in the blood. There are of course other types of pathogens that can cause illness in the blood, so viremia is illness associated with viruses in the blood and toxemia is illness associated not with a live organism but with its toxins contaminating the blood. Lymphangitis is inflammation of lymph vessels characterized by red streaks along the arm or legs. This is what you can see in the upper image right here. So this is the path of the lymph vessel throughout the leg here and you can see that it has been reddened along the path of where the inflammation and infection has taken place. And these are often accompanied by buboes, 
which is the medical term for swollen lymph nodes. So here's an example of swollen groin lymph nodes. There are lymph nodes occurring throughout your body, including in your groin, in your neck, in your armpits, and other locations. But here's a clear example of buboes of the lymph nodes in the groin. At this time, it's also worth clearing up some terminology surrounding blood infections because these are terms that are often sort of mixed up with each other in regular language, like sepsis, septic shock, septicemia. They are related to each other, but they don't mean the same thing. So septicemia is defined as bacteremia, wherein the bacteria are not just present in the blood, but they are reproducing in the blood and spreading via the circulatory system. Sepsis, on the other hand, is defined as a systemic inflammatory response caused by the release of pro-inflammatory compounds into the blood in response to an infection that may be, but is not necessarily localized in the blood. So sepsis can occur whether or not the infection is of the blood itself, it could be a skin infection, it could be pneumonia, and whether or not the blood is infected does not impact whether or not a case can be defined as sepsis. What is the defining parameter of sepsis is that there are these inflammatory compounds that are being dumped into the blood and causing this systemic inflammatory response whereby a person experiences fever, chills, elevated heart rate, and perhaps most importantly, hypotension, which is a drop in blood pressure below normal levels of blood pressure. And so this hypotension is what eventually leads to septic shock, and it's the final stage of sepsis wherein the blood pressure drops so low that organ failure occurs, meaning the blood flow can no longer support organs. Septic shock, when a disease reaches this stage, has a 50% mortality rate associated with it because when the blood pressure is this low, it cannot be controlled by the addition of fluids and it's a very dangerous state that potentially leads to organ failure. So if we think back as to why hypotension, why this drop in blood pressure occurs in response to inflammatory compounds, you may remember learning that part of the inflammation response is vasodilation. So the blood vessels expand, their diameter gets larger, and the purpose of that is to allow blood to travel to the tissues more easily, bringing with it all of the leukocytes and antimicrobial compounds that are meant to fight an infection. But sepsis is where that reaction gets out of control. Vasodilation takes place throughout the entire body, and increasing the diameter of those blood vessels leads to a drop in the blood pressure that can actually be dangerous for a person. So it's an immune response that is counterproductive in its level of enthusiasm, if you will, towards fighting the pathogen. And then septic shock is the final stage of that where it gets so dangerous that it leads to organ failure. So now that we've covered some basic disease terminology and we have looked at some foundational information about the structure of these systems, here are the infections that we are going to be looking at. As you can see, there are quite a few bacterial infections and that's where we're gonna start. We're gonna start with the bacterial ones and we're gonna begin with toxic shock syndrome. So toxic shock syndrome can be caused by a variety of different pathogens, but the most common one is Staphylococcus aureus. Staphylococcus aureus, as we've learned before, is capable of producing toxins. We saw this when we discussed how it can be involved in food poisoning. It produces one toxin in particular called a super antigen toxin that induces sepsis and septic shock. And it's called a super antigen because it induces the body to have this extreme inflammatory response to that toxin. It's characterized by a sudden onset of vomiting, diarrhea, a fever greater than 102, hypotension, and a rash that peels, as you can see in this image right here. <laughs> 
it is typically treated with removal of necrotic tissue, medications to elevate the blood pressure, as well as antibiotics to kill the bacteria. The mortality rate is somewhere around 3%. And how do you get toxic shock syndrome? Well, it can arise from a variety of infections throughout the body. It can arise from a skin infection, from a respiratory infection. However, the people that are most at risk are women who have existing colonization of Staphylococcus aureus in the vaginal canal and who use tampons or diaphragms or contraceptive sponges, something that is inserted into the vaginal canal and then left for too long because leaving these objects can foment infection and toxin buildup that leads to toxic shock syndrome. So this is the group that's most at risk and it's important for that reason to follow guidelines related to the use of these items. Next, we have purpural sepsis. Purpural sepsis is the variety of sepsis that arises during the period of purpurium, which is the period of recovery after childbirth. So it's essentially sepsis arising from an infection related to the delivery of a child. The infection initiates in the uterus or a local surgical site and then spreads systemically. Purpural sepsis continues to be among the top causes of maternal death worldwide. It is less common in developed countries such as the United States, but in developing countries, it accounts for approximately 11% of maternal deaths and the offending pathogen is often, but not always, Streptococcus pyogenes, which, as we've learned before, is a dangerous pathogen involved in diseases such as streptococcal pharyngitis, scarlet fever, and skin infections, and it can also lead to purpural sepsis as well. That brings us to our first checkpoint, where we're going to look way, way back at chapter 1 when we talked about the history of microbiology and Ignaz Semmelweis who was a physician who observed that women tended to suffer from purpural sepsis after the physicians attending their hospital birth failed to wash their hands before helping to deliver the baby. So because these women who he observed acquired the disease in the hospital, it would be considered a what infection? How would we describe that infection? Next, we have bacterial endocarditis. Endocarditis is defined as inflammation of the endocardium. The endocardium is the inner layer of tissue that lines the heart muscle. And endocarditis can be caused by a variety of different sources. But here, we're talking about bacterial endocarditis. People most at risk for bacterial endocarditis are those who already have abnormal heart valves, either as a result of them being born congenitally with them, or damage that has occurred sometime in their life to their heart valves. This leaves a person more susceptible to infections of the endocardium. This disease can develop quickly, in which case it is considered acute endocarditis, or it can develop slowly in which case it is considered subacute endocarditis. Both of them are dangerous, but they're caused by different pathogens. Typically, subacute endocarditis is most commonly caused by members of the alpha hemolytic streptococci group, and it progresses over the course of several months. Now, alpha hemolytic streptococci We've learned previously what alpha hemolytic bacteria have the capability of doing. In this checkpoint, I want you to tell me what is their relationship with red blood cells. What can they do to red blood cells? And are they more or less virulent than beta hemolytic bacteria? So whereas subacute endocarditis progresses over several months, Acute endocarditis progresses more quickly, over days or weeks. It's most often caused by Staphylococcus aureus, and it results in the rapid destruction of heart valves if it is not recognized and treated immediately. Next, we have rheumatic fever. 
So rheumatic fever is actually an autoimmune complication. It's a complication that can arise if a person that has a streptococcal infection, such as pharyngitis or scarlet fever, goes untreated. It used to be fairly common in the United States, but now that strep throat is able to be recognized and treated with antibiotics, it is far less common. But what essentially happens is, as a result of this untreated infection, the body develops an autoimmune response, meaning the immune system begins to attack structures in the body. The antibodies that are generated against the streptococcal pathogen will have cross reactions where they start attaching to surface proteins on parts of the body, including especially the joints, which is the namesake of rheumatic fever. You may have heard of rheumatoid arthritis. That's a type of arthritis characterized by nodules in the joints. And so this is rheumatic fever because the joints develop these arthritic nodules. As you can see in this image right here, this is the elbow joint right here. And this over here is not the elbow. It's an arthritic nodule resulting from rheumatic fever. Even worse, the antibodies will react to cardiac tissue and have this autoimmune response against the heart, which in about 50% of cases irreversibly and permanently damages the heart valves, which then can leave a person susceptible to acquiring endocarditis, as we just saw, because endocarditis is more likely to occur in people who have damaged heart valves. Next, we have tularemia. Tularemia is also colloquially known as rabbit fever, named after one of its reservoirs. It's caused by a gram-negative cockle bacillus called Francisella tularensis. And if you remember, the cockle bacillus shape is one that is sort of oval in nature. It's not a perfect circle, but it's not a rod either. And here's a microscopy image of that morphology. Tularemia is highly contagious via contact with infected rabbits or the handling of infected rabbit meat. It can also be transmitted through tick bites, although this is less common than direct contact transmission. Once the pathogen gets inside of the bloodstream, it starts to multiply inside of phagocytes, so it can evade the ability of phagocytes to destroy it, and instead, it can hitch a ride in those phagocytes through the bloodstream and travel to other organs. Once it travels to the lymph nodes, it colonizes them and results in these structures that we refer to as buboes. Buboes are highly swollen lymph nodes. You can see the lymph nodes of the face and neck here in this individual with tularemia are extremely swollen and inflamed. Tularemia is also a disease that is considered to have high potential as a biological warfare agent similar to anthrax because although this is not its normal transmission route, inhalation of Francisella tularensis leads to a very severe life-threatening infection with a 30 to 60% untreated mortality rate. And so for this reason, tularemia is considered a potential biological weapon and cells of Francisella tularensis have to be handled in a biosafety level 3 lab which has escalated safety protocols. Next, we have brucellosis. Brucellosis is caused by several members within the genus Brucella, but all of them share in common that they are gram-negative cockle bacilli, just like we saw Francisella tularensis. These guys are those oval-shaped cells, they're not perfect circles. It is the world's most common zoonotic disease. It might seem strange to us, but it is the disease that is most often transmitted from animals to humans. That's what zoonotic is, I'll remind you. It's rare in the United States. We never hear about brucellosis because livestock animals in the United States are vaccinated against this disease. However, around the rest of the world altogether, it is the world's most common zoonosis. It's transmitted often by a contact with livestock, uh, 
or through consumption of unpasteurized dairy products. The bacteria that cause this, the members of the genus Brucella, produce an exoenzyme called urease to resist the stomach acid. You may remember that urease generates ammonia, which is a base, and that neutralizes stomach acid and offers a protective effect for the bacteria. And once it enters the lymphatic system, it infects the phagocytes and it disseminates to the other organs. Symptoms of this disease are usually flu-like, fever, aches, sweats, loss of appetite, and it has a pretty low mortality rate of only about 2%. In this checkpoint, while we're on the topic of brucellosis and we're looking at one of its virulence factors, the production of urease, this may remind us that there's a disease of the digestive system that also involves a bacterium that produces urease. What is this disease and what is the name of the bacterium that produces urease? Our next disease is anthrax. So anthrax is also a disease that is considered to have potential as a biological warfare agent. And we'll talk about why on the next slide. But it is caused by a gram-positive endosporm forming streptobacillus-shaped species called bacillus anthracis. So in this image right here, we can see that the cells are arranged in a streptobacilli morphology. They're in chains rods arranged in chains and we can also see that in this strain it is clear to us that there are endospores present so the endospores are the unstained compartments inside of those rods and remember the endospores are these resting cells that are highly resistant to any sort of environmental threat and that makes anthrax as dangerous as it is because the endospores are able to get into the circulatory and lymphatic systems and germinate inside of phagocytes where they release two exotoxins. One of them is edema toxin, which causes swelling. That's what edema means is swelling. It causes swelling and interferes with the cell mediated immune response. And then there's also lethal toxin. Lethal toxin targets and kills macrophages, also inhibiting the immune response to this pathogen. There are actually three different transmission routes for anthrax, which pretty much dictate the severity of the infection. By far the most common is cutaneous anthrax, which is where anthrax enters via the parenteral route, so through cuts or wounds in the skin, a vesicle forms at the site of the infection and then ruptures leaving a black scab and this accounts for 90% of naturally occurring cases of anthrax. It's also the least serious form of anthrax. The other two forms are the more serious and the reasons why anthrax is considered as a potential bioweapon. Gastrointestinal anthrax is where anthrax enters through the ingestion of endospores in food. It causes ulcerated lesions throughout the GI tract, and even when treated, the mortality rate is up to 40%. Respiratory anthrax is also extremely dangerous. It's transmitted via the inhalation of endospores, and it progresses rapidly to septic shock in 2-3 to three days. The treated mortality rate is even higher at approximately 45%. So because even when treated, anthrax is so dangerous, that's why it's considered a pathogen of particular importance for avoiding bioterror attacks. Next is gas gangrene. So gangrene is defined as the necrosis of soft tissue resulting from the loss of blood supply that creates anaerobic conditions. So when blood supply to a particular area of the body is cut off through a variety of causes, one of the more common ones is diabetes, then this can create anaerobic conditions because oxygen is no longer being delivered to that tissue. Remember, anaerobic means absence of oxygen. Once this happens, 
it creates the perfect conditions for Clostridium perfringens or other members of the genus Clostridium to germinate in these tissues because Clostridium is an anaerobe, an obligate anaerobe that cannot survive in the presence of oxygen. So taking that oxygen away through loss of blood flow allows Clostridium perfringens to germinate. And like Bacillus, this is another genus that can produce endospores. So those resting resistant cell structures. It's also a gram-positive species, a gram-positive rod-shaped species. Once the Clostridium perfringens has germinated and has initiated an infection and is colonizing this necrotic tissue, it will perform fermentation. And as a result of that fermentation, gas bubbles are generated of carbon dioxide and hydrogen gas that are byproducts of its fermentative metabolism. Other signs include a thin yellowish discharge from the infected area as well as a foul smell and gas gangrene is incredibly dangerous even with antibiotic treatment. You can see in cases of gas gangrene that the necrosis of the tissue will advance several inches per hour visibly even with antibiotics being administered and so the mortality rate of this condition is over 50%. Our next disease is plague. Plague may sound like an antiquated disease, but it's still around. And it's still around in Arizona, in fact. It's caused by a gram-negative bacillus, Yersinia pestis, and the untreated mortality rate is 50 to 75%. Treated mortality rate is much, much lower but untreated, the disease is very, very dangerous. Back in ancient times, when antibiotics were not available, it is thought to have caused 25% of the world's population in the 14th century to die. It is the cause of death for a quarter of the world's population during that century. Fast forward to today, and there are an average of 7 cases in the US every year, and all those cases are pretty much treatable. This map right here shows you the incidence of cases of plague spanning between 1970 and 2018. It may be unsettling to note on this map that plague is endemic to the Four Corners area, including Northern Arizona. And that's because it is in a rodent reservoir and is transmitted by fleas. This is not the only way that plague can be transmitted, but it is the most common way. In fact, there are three different forms of plague. The bubonic plague, septic, and pneumonic plague. And the bubonic plague is the most common form, accounting for 80% of cases where the pathogen is transmitted from fleas that have had a blood meal on a rodent reservoir, and then go on to bite a human and transmit it to the human circulatory system. This form of plague is associated with fever, hypotension, and extremely swollen lymph nodes, buboes, which are the namesake of the bubonic plague. The mortality rate is 55% if untreated, but only 10% if treated. 10% however is still a relatively high mortality rate for diseases in our time. Septicemic plague is much less common than the bubonic plague. This is transmitted through the parenteral route, and so it's transmitted through the, for example, body fluids of an infected person getting into a cut or a wound. Signs and symptoms include subdural hemorrhaging and tissue necrosis, particularly on the hands. And so that's what you can see down here in this image is subdural hemorrhaging and then the necrotic tissue developing. And this is the namesake of why the plague was called the Black Death, because it caused this blackening of the tissue as the tissue died at the extremities. It has a nearly 100% mortality rate if untreated, a 50% mortality rate if treated. Those numbers are similar to the third and final type of plague, which is pneumonic plague. This is the rarest form of plague, it's transmitted through droplets, which really doesn't happen very often, 
And so when you see those images of those old timey plague doctors with their bird beak masks that were intended to prevent airborne inhalation of the plague, they were a little bit right, but not really, because pneumonic plague generally is not how plague is transmitted. Nonetheless, when it is transmitted in droplet form and inhaled, it results in rapid development of pneumonia and progression of the disease to septic shock, leading to again nearly 100% mortality rate untreated and 50% when treated. Okay, so now we're on to our fourth checkpoint here. I have given you three images of gram stains and I would like you to match the gram stain with the disease that might be indicated by the bacterial pathogen shown. We've got anthrax, plague, and tularemia. Our final topic in bacterial infections is zoonotic febrile diseases, which is actually a category of infections rather than a single infection. There are quite a few diseases that fall under this category, but what unifies them is that they are zoonotic, meaning transmitted from animals, specifically through insect vectors. And they are febrile, meaning fever causing. And like I said, there are a variety of diseases under this category. But we are going to select just three of them. And these three are ones that are endemic and more common in the United States. The first of them is anaplasmosis caused by the bacterium Anaplasma phagocytophilum. The vector of this pathogen is ticks and its reservoir is rodents. It causes flu-like symptoms with up to 50% hospitalization rate to control those symptoms, but with a less than 1% mortality rate. As you can see in this map, this one is endemic to the United States mostly in the northeastern region of the United States. Next is Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever. Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever is caused by Rickettsia rickettsii, which is a pathogen that actually it's an intracellular bacterial pathogen, meaning it invades cells to cause disease. Again, the vector is ticks, and the reservoir are rodents and rabbits, Despite the fact that it's called Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever, it is not commonly seen in the Rocky Mountain states. Instead, it's commonly seen in the southeastern United States and Midwest. The symptoms and signs include flu-like symptoms, and in severe cases, a measles-like rash that you can see in this lower image that begins on the hands and then spreads to the rest of the body. When treated with antibiotics, the mortality rate is about 3%. Our third and final zoonotic febrile disease is probably the one that you're most likely to have heard of, which is Lyme disease. This is the most common vector-borne illness in the United States, caused by the pathogen Borrelia burgdorferi. The vector of this is ticks, and the reservoir is deer, mice, and more rarely birds. When a person is bitten by a tick infected with Borrelia burgdorferi, the first sign in most cases is typically a bullseye rash that occurs at the site of the tick bite accompanied by flu-like symptoms. And when recognizing the disease at this early stage, it is treatable. But sometimes that bullseye rash can occur on, for example, the scalp, which makes it impossible to see and the disease goes unnoticed. Untreated cases of Lyme disease can cause disseminated symptoms and signs throughout the body and progress to causing irregular heartbeats, neurological damage that is permanent, and arthritis. So it's important to recognize and treat early. And we can see, similar to anaplasmosis, Lyme disease is endemic to the northeastern areas of the United States. So this brings us to the end of our look at bacterial infections of the circulatory and lymphatic systems. We're moving on now to viral infections, but because this is a longer lecture and we're here in between topics, if you're looking for a place to take a break, this is a good halfway point to take your break. If not, we're going to move on to talking about the viral infections.
the first of which is mononucleosis or mono and as well as its related disease Burkitt's lymphoma. Mono is caused by human herpes virus 4, HHV4, which is also known as the Epstein-Barr virus. It's transmitted typically through saliva and this infection is nearly universal across the world. Virtually everyone acquires an infection with human herpes 4 and when they acquire it during childhood, the infection is harmless and asymptomatic. However, if a person's first exposure to HHV4 is post-puberty, then instead of being asymptomatic, the disease manifests as pharyngitis, fever, fatigue, and swollen lymph nodes, or in other words, what we know as mono. Mononucleosis is named mononucleosis for the unusually shaped nuclei of the lymphocytes that are characteristic of this disease, as pointed out here in this image. Mono is caused by the same pathogen that is related to Burkitt's lymphoma, and so another variation of infection with HHV4 is that which occurs in an individual who already has an ongoing malaria or HIV infection. When this is the case, the individual has a weaker immune response to the Epstein-Barr virus and can develop Burkitt's lymphoma, which is a fast-growing tumor of the facial and neck lymph nodes, as you can see in this image right here. It's rare in the United States, and it's more common, of course, in areas of the world where malaria is endemic. Next, we have cytomegalovirus infection. This is caused by human herpes virus 5, also known as cytomegalovirus. It is a latent infection of leukocytes that causes host cell enlargements, which the technical term for it is cytomegaly. So we can see the cellular enlargement happening here of these leukocytes. But despite this, the infection is virtually always asymptomatic. It's also nearly universal like HHV4. 80% of the US is estimated to be carriers based upon antibody testing. 50% are estimated to acquire it by adulthood. The trouble with cytomegalovirus infection is that if the primary infection occurs when a woman is pregnant, there is an approximately 20% chance of cytomegalic inclusion disease affecting her child. And this is associated with birth defects, including growth retardation, jaundice, deafness, blindness, and intellectual disability. Next is chikungunya. So we're going to go through a series of viral infections that are transmitted by mosquitoes, the first of which is chikungunya. It has nothing to do with chickens. This is the name for the disease in the native language in Eastern Africa. And so chikungunya does not have anything to do with chickens. It is caused, however, by the chikungunya virus, which is abbreviated ChikV. The vectors are the Aedes aegypti and the A. albopictus mosquitoes, which you can see right here in this image. It is associated with a high fever, joint pain, and rash that produces large blisters. However, the disease is usually self-limiting and rarely fatal. It was previously limited to the continents of Africa, Asia, and Europe. However, due to the changing of the habitat range of these mosquitoes and it being transferred around the world, it's now spread to North and South America. Next is yellow fever. Yellow fever is caused by yellow fever virus and it is also transmitted by the Aedes aegypti mosquito. It can also be transmitted through direct contact with an infected individual. Most cases are mild and include fever, chills, headache, nausea, and vomiting but 3 in 10 cases can progress to what is considered moderate or severe or malignant yellow fever. These are associated with jaundice, which is the namesake of the yellow fever disease. Jaundice causes yellowing of the skin and mucous membranes of the eyes.
as you can see in this image here, and also associated with hemorrhaging, seizures, and organ failure. And half of the cases of yellow fever that progress to moderate or severe stages end in death. It is preventable with a vaccine that is not given in the United States unless you're traveling to a country where this is endemic, as well as with mosquito control. And our third infection that is transmitted by mosquitoes is called dengue fever, caused by the dengue virus. This is also transmitted by the Aedes aegypti or the Aedes albopictus mosquitoes. Most of the infections with dengue are asymptomatic, however symptomatic infections exhibit a high fever, severe joint pain, severe bone pain, and muscle pain that is sometimes described as feeling like your bones are breaking, as well as internal hemorrhaging. Dengue is a leading cause of death among children in regions where it is endemic. We can see that regions where it is endemic follow closely the January and July isotherms. These are lines that fall across points in the northern and southern hemispheres that have approximately equal temperatures at the same times of the year. And so these correspond closely to the habitat range of mosquitoes because it is the freezing point of these areas or the time at which frost occur in these areas that in some ways dictates the ability of mosquitoes to survive in these areas. Mosquitoes require warmer tropical climates, and so you can see in the northern hemisphere, the Aedes aegypti and Aedes albopictus mosquitoes tend not to reside in areas where there are colder temperatures. Dengue fever also exhibits something called antibody enhancement that makes it particularly dangerous. Antibody enhancement describes a phenomenon where if a person already has antibodies against the dengue virus, then their secondary infection is actually worse than their primary infection, which goes against all of our wisdom about how the immune system works. And scientists are starting to unravel why this is the case. But the troubling thing about this antibody enhancement was that when a vaccine was starting to undergo development for dengue virus in 2017, it was discovered that among children who had previously had dengue before, the vaccine could, in some cases, act like a second infection and cause severe dengue. And so in this one weird case with this really weird disease that exhibits antibody enhancement, the vaccine was dangerous for some children when it underwent trials in the Philippines. And for that reason, the vaccine was taken off the market and a new vaccine has been under development since then against dengue that will not trigger this antibody enhancement reaction. So this brings us to another checkpoint about mosquito-borne diseases. Why are epidemiologists concerned about potential increased incidence of dengue, yellow fever, and chikungunya in light of ongoing climate change? So we're on to our final viral infections here. We have Ebola virus disease next. Ebola virus finds a reservoir in fruit bats and it is transmitted through ingestion direct contact with an infected individual's body fluids or in direct contact through fomites that have come in contact with those bodily fluids. This means that extreme protective measures are required in cases of Ebola outbreaks because it can be transmitted through blood, saliva, sweat, things that have come into contact with an infected person. Those items are able to transmit it to other individuals through indirect contact transmission. And we can see here some of the extreme protective measures with personal protective equipment and special chambers that are used to limit the transmission of Ebola. The initial symptoms of Ebola might seem relatively innocuous, which is actually problematic because initially it produces flu-like symptoms that may not seem very serious, but then it rapidly progresses over the course of three days to hemorrhaging or excreting blood from the GI tract, skin, and other sites, which usually quickly leads to the development of shock and death. 
the mortality rate associated with Ebola is 90%. It is an extremely deadly disease. There are vaccines under development for this infection. Two have been approved, but the level of protection that those vaccines offer is still not completely clear and hasn't been well studied. And our last viral disease is Hantavirus. Hantavirus is a disease that is endemic to our region here in Arizona. The reservoir for this disease is rodents, and it doesn't have an insect vector. Rather, it is transmitted by inhaling aerosolized urine and feces of rodents that are carriers of this virus. It is extremely deadly. Mortality is 50% and it presents with initial flu-like symptoms that rapidly progress to pneumonia, shock, and death. So it's very important to be mindful and careful when working around sources of potential mouse droppings and rodent droppings, and to use proper protection and proper avoidance of inhaling their droppings. So now we're going to move on to our final categories. We've got our parasites, the protozoans, and the helminths. The first protozoan infection of the circulatory system is Chagas disease, caused by Trypanosoma cruzi. This infection is carried by the reservoirs of opossums, armadillos, and rodents, and its vector is this little guy right here, the triadamine bug, which is also colloquially known as the kissing bug. The way that this infection is transmitted is by this insect, which will bite around the edges of the mouth because it is attracted to the carbon dioxide in our breath. It mostly operates nocturnally, and so it's something that can occur while you're sleeping if you are unprotected and out in the wild. The pathogen, however, is transmitted by its feces, not through its bite. So the bite will occur, and then once that wound is present, the bug will defecate near the wound and through that defecation, expel the pathogen which can then enter through the wound that it has created through its bite. Most symptoms with Chagas disease are not present. Most infections are asymptomatic. But among symptomatic infections, the signs and symptoms include fever, swollen lymph nodes, vomiting, and diarrhea. Chronic infections can lead to more serious consequences including damage to the nervous system, cardiac damage, and these can all be fatal. This bug, it's worth mentioning, is endemic to our region here in Arizona, and there have been studies that have shown that Chagas disease is not uncommon for it to be carried by insects that are found in the southern parts of the state. So next we have Toxoplasmosis, caused by the protozoan Toxoplasma gondii, which you can see right here. The definitive hosts of this pathogen are cats, and the intermediate hosts are other mammals, including humans. Usually, toxoplasmosis infections are asymptomatic or mild, and antibody surveillance indicates that about 23% of the United States, almost 1 in 4 people, are infected latently with toxoplasmosis. And usually that's not a problem, but when the infection is acquired during pregnancy, not if a woman has an ongoing infection, but if she gets exposed during pregnancy, then a congenital infection can lead to pregnancy loss and severe birth defects. So this is why it's important and recommended not to scoop litter boxes because it's transmitted through cat's fecal matter when you are pregnant. It's also recommended not to eat any unwashed fruits and vegetables or work intensely with soil because it can also be found in soil samples that are contaminated with cat fecal matter. The strange thing about toxoplasmosis is that this infection has some pretty well documented effects on behavior both for other mammals as well as humans that acquire it. In this study right here, it is found that rats that are infected with toxoplasmosis lose their fear of cats. And so there seems to be some sort of symbiotic relationship between cats and this parasite that they carry, whereby spreading it to other animals around them, 
animals such as rats lose their predation fear of cats and become more susceptible to predation. This article right here, it studies toxoplasmosis in humans and found that humans who are infected with toxoplasmosis are more likely to exhibit entrepreneurial behaviors when controlling for several factors. But what I found especially striking about these studies is that there are two studies authored by completely different authors that both reference 80s movies and their titles, Fatal Attraction and Risky Business. It's so, so bizarre. Okay, next we have malaria. This is our third and final protozoan parasite disease of the circulatory system. This is caused by members of the genus Plasmodium. There are four different members of this genus that can cause malaria. We'll talk about the most severe one on the next slide, but the vector for these is the Anopheles mosquito, a different mosquito from the diseases we've just talked about such as yellow fever, chikungunya, and dengue. This is a different species of mosquito. It's associated with fever, chills, vomiting, and severe headache which can be interspersed with asymptomatic periods which can sometimes make it difficult for malaria to be diagnosed because people who are afflicted think that they've gotten better and then the symptoms reoccur. Malaria used to be present in the United States. However, it was eliminated in 1949 through mosquito control. So simply by eliminating the vector, the disease was eliminated because there are no more Anopheles mosquitoes endemic to the United States capable of transmitting this disease. However, around the world, it continues to be a major pandemic. It affects 300 million people worldwide annually, but the majority of deaths occur in Africa, which is the continent along with Southeast Asia where the most virulent species in this genus is endemic, Plasmodium falciparum. So Plasmodium falciparum is generally found in Africa and it causes the most severe form of malaria. The reason why Plasmodium falciparum is more virulent is because while all forms of Plasmodium infect red blood cells, Plasmodium falciparum destroys a larger amount of red blood cells and it causes surface abnormalities on the blood cells as you can see here in this image and these surface abnormalities prevent the ability of the red blood cells to move through capillaries so they get clogged. And the result is anemia, tissue necrosis as the blood flow is inhibited, and organ failure. The mortality of an infection with Plasmodium falciparum is about 50% if untreated. Malaria is also a tricky pathogen to combat in terms of prevention because it has many developmental forms that it goes through as it moves from host to host. And so that has made the development of a vaccine exceedingly difficult because any effective vaccine would need to protect against all of these different developmental forms. However, there is a vaccine under development that is showing great promise that has shown up to be 77% effective in young children, which represents the demographic group that is most susceptible to death from malaria. And so this is a huge advancement in preventing malaria around the world, a disease that infects millions of people and kills millions of people every year. Our last disease that we have to talk about is schistosomiasis. Schistosomiasis is caused by a helminthic parasite, specifically flukes, which are a type of flatworm from the genus Schistosoma. These are the only type of flukes that have been documented as invading the body through the skin. So people can acquire schistosomiasis infection while swimming or bathing in contaminated water because the fluke goes directly through the skin not through an orifice. These flukes will lay eggs in the human bloodstream and then those eggs will invade the bladder or intestines most commonly. They have an interesting system where the male actually lives and is attached to the female. Here we can see that the female is the lighter colored and thicker worm and then the male is the longer darker colored worm. A chronic infection with the eggs may involve them lodging in tissues 
and causing scarring and organ damage that can be dangerous. This fluke is endemic to Asia, South America, and Africa, and is estimated to affect approximately 250 million people worldwide. So now we've reached the end of our discussion of parasitic infections, and we have only one more checkpoint to cap off our lecture. So in this checkpoint, I'd like you to identify two diseases that we've talked about here that are typically only problematic if they are acquired during pregnancy. Once you've finished with this checkpoint, you are finished with chapter 25.